Wow, that was a great song. Really good. Children, you're dismissed to Children's Church. You can go with... Who's doing Children's Church this morning? Lindsay? Okay. If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're beginning a new series called Reboot. And uh, so that might be a self-explanatory phrase, but I'll explain it to you just a little bit as we go along. <clears throat> Wait till the kids get out. Don't you love our kids? Amen. 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 Second Samuel talks about David bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. How many are familiar with this text? Okay, three people. Wow, we're going to have to really get into this uh, some, for your biblical knowledge. 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 15. Now, I'm just going to let you know, I'll probably butcher a lot of these names. It doesn't really about, matter about the names. It's a story that counts. Uh, but I'm going to try my best. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. Now, I want to stop right there and just say just something about this. The logistics for 30,000 men to come together in one place at one time is amazing. It is amazing. Listen, I was a part of logistic team in Fort Drum, New York, in 10th Mountain Division. Our whole division had just over 10,000 soldiers, okay? So 20,000 in the whole post, all right? We're talking about 30,000 men. Would you agree with me that that must be very intentional to be able to do that? Okay, very good. He called together all the men of Israel, about 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala and Judah to bring up the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart. Everybody say new cart. And they brought it to the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzziah and Ahau were sons of Abinadab. They were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahau was walking in front of it. David and all of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with the cassinets, the harps, the lyres, the timbrels, the sistrums, and the cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Isaiah reached out and took hold of the ark because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzziah because of his irreverent act. Everybody say irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down, and he died right there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzziah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzziah, which, by the way, means God's breakout against Uzziah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He is not willing to take the ark of God, the Lord, with him to the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Say, blessed him. Blessed. Now, King David was told, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God to the house of Obed-Edom, to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were crying, carrying the ark of the Lord, Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and he fatted calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his mind, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and with sounds of trumpets. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reading of the word, and we ask this morning that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Well, we've just entered a new decade. 2020 has begun. 2020 is synonymous with vision. How many of you ever heard vision's perfect at 2020? 
Yeah, okay. How many of you heard hindsight is always 2020? I'll take issue with that. I don't agree with that. But anyway, that's the same. Most people say that. 2020, the year of vision, the decade that's going to bring us closer to the prominence in which we seek, we say. But what does 2020 really hold for us? I don't know. I remember living in back in the 1900s. How many of you remember that? How many of you partied like it was 1999? Yeah, I did that. Lived it, sung it, and lived it, and did it. And back in the day of 1999, right before it turned 2000, there was this big thing that was going on about the scare of a virus being uh, spread throughout all the computers and the whole world was going to crash. Do you all remember that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you could party like 1999 and then live like the second coming of Christ because everything was going to crumble and Jesus was going to come back again. We know that didn't happen. But there was a lot of preparation for this. And I went to some classes uh, <clears throat> in preparation for this and in the 90s that was, that was uh, uh, some friends of mine was doing and things that were taking place. And I've heard of other people taking classes. And basically they were saying, if your computer freezes, don't fret. If it freeze, don't fret. If it freezes, don't fret. It's a little catchy saying, right? If it freezes, don't fret. What you need to do is reboot. Just reboot. You know how do you reboot? You take the power button and you press and hold it for 10 seconds and all of a sudden it will die. It will die and then you let it sit. And then after you let it sit, you repower. Reboot. And let everything kind of settle. And all the programs that we're running that doesn't need to be running will kind of close. And only the things that are appropriate will come back up. And it will free up your system and your memory to do the essential task until we figure out what to do next. It's called Reboot. I got thinking about this as we entered this decade of another two and zeros. And I thought... This might be appropriate for us because we're going through a lot of stuff in the world. We're going through junk all over the world. There's wars and rumors of wars every which way. People are so divided in our nation, it's, it's unbelievable. Even in our own denomination, there's rumors of splits and divisions, which, by the way, is probably going to happen, but it's not right now. Even though you might have seen some news reports about the United Methodist Church have split, we have not split yet, but it's probably going to come. But don't fret, this too shall pass, and God will work everything out. Amen? Amen? I'm not here to serve a denomination, I'm here to serve the Lord. And He'll put me in whatever denomination He sees fit for my gifts and services and talents that we can reach our community together for Christ. And that's all. We're not going to let it be a distraction. Amen? Amen. Amen. So there's a lot of stuff, disunity, every which way. And I thought it was interesting this morning in some of our traditional services that we were actually saying Psalms 133 where it says, Blessed is those who dwell together in unity. It's precious and it's wonderful. And yet, I believe sometimes unity is sought at in the wrong way, in the wrong purposes. And that's, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the series. That's not what we're going to talk about a little, this morning. But we're talking about rebooting. Maybe it's time that, especially as Christians, we take some time and we reboot. Maybe we've got so many things going on in our life and we're so busy that we're, we're just kind of freezing and we're fretting. And maybe we need to stop freezing and fretting, and maybe we just need to stop and reboot. Let everything go down, and then bring it back up in the power of God, in the illumination of God, in the instruction of God, in the order of God. Let the most important things come first, and then let everything else be sifted up as needed and prioritized in its proper order. Maybe that should be how we should enter this new decade. So we're going to be talking about rebooting, what that looks like. How can we reboot in our life? And I wanted to start out this morning with this text because this is a story about David. And David was described as a man after God's own heart. Remember? 
And David messed up. He messed up. You say, well, how did he mess up? I'm glad you asked, God. I'm going to explain it to you. As as fellow said, I'm going to explain it to you. Okay. What happened was, he had long wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which is, re remember, the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God in those days. And he longed to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, and, and there he would... God would have his habitat with David and, and the children of Israel, all which should be. So got together with these men. He goes out, 30,000 of them. So he's very intentional about going up and bringing the ark. 30,000. They go get their ark, and they build a new cart. They build a new cart. And mistake number one. And then they attach the new cart to an oxen. And mistake number two. And then he was going down, they crossed, they crossed a, a threshing hole, a threshing floor. And by the way, a threshing floor uh, could be s some boards and planks that is in a field. Every field had a threshing floor because they didn't have grains and stuff like we do now and combines that shift it and just have grains. So what they would do is gather the wheat, or the mostly is wheat, they would gather the grains from the field and they would bring it to the side of the field and there they would do the threshing so the chaff would stay in the field because they didn't want to haul the chaff and the wheat back. They just wanted to haul the wheat. Okay, So they would have uh, hewn stones or they would have planks or something like that, usually by the road or in the road by the field to be able to do their, their sifting. And then they would carry the wheat back to their places that they would store it and use it for the winter. So they were on their road and 30,000 men. Can you imagine the sound of 30,000 men? Worshiping and praising God and doing, you know, the tambourines and the cymbals and all this kind of stuff and singing. Don't you know that would be an awesome, awesome thing? I mean, I've gone to Promise Keepers before. We've been to Memphis. We've been to Louisville. We've been to Nashville. We've been to all these different places. I went to Washington, D.C. with a million man uh, prayer vigil one time uh, as back in the, in the early 90s. And, and to hear these men, when you get like five or six to 10 to 12,000 men singing Amazing Grace or worshiping songs like we sang this morning, uh, it's, it is truly, I'm just thinking about it, it makes the hair stand up on my arms. It's just amazing. 30,000. But see, all, in all his intentionality, David messed up, messed up with one thing. He didn't ask God. Because if he had asked God and consulted Scripture in any shape, form, or fashion, he would have found out in Leviticus and in Numbers there was quite clear instructions about how the Ark of the Covenant was to be handled. First of all, it should never be shipped anywhere. It's not an Amazon product. It's a holy product. And they built a new cart, hooked it up to an oxen, and they were rolling it down the street. The only way that the ark could be transported was by the hand of the Levites, period. And Uzziah, as good a guy as he was, was not a Levite. So they built a new cart, and they were shipping the ark, and that's a no-no. The ark is supposed to be carried by the Levite. Second of all, as the, as the ark was being carried, they crossed this threshing floor, and the, and the oxen stumbled. And even though the ark was about to be tumbled, Uzziah, having a helping hand, placed the hand on the ark. But there was consequences for disobedience. There was consequences for sin. There was consequences for not following instruction. And Uzziah, even though he was a good man, because God was not obeyed and not honored in this most holy thing, had the consequences of death there on the spot. God's anger burned deep according to Scripture. Hmm. That's sobering, isn't it? It's sobering the fact that God requires us not just to mean well, He, he requires us to obey. And all the things that we're doing, we're to obey. 30,000 men couldn't overcome disobedience of God's instruction. 30,000 singing and praising God couldn't overcome disobedience. Disobedience. You know, we preach a lot in the church nowadays about love, about grace, and about mercy. And I think that is right. I think it's good. And I'm the first to champion those three attributes of God all the time. Because without His love, I am nothing. Without His grace, 
I am nothing. And without His mercy, I am damned. So His love, His mercy, and His grace means a lot to me. It's life-giving. It's life-giving. But you see, sometimes I think we fail because we've over-talked about it in generations past. And now we're under-talking about it. And that's the aspect of disobedience or sin. God requires us to be obedient. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is what God desires for His people to be in relationship with Him, is obedience. And when we disobey, when we don't follow God in obedience, it's called sin. Say it. Sin. sin. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And you know what? There are days that I still am lost in my sin. Not lost going to hell. Lost and I don't know my direction. Lost and I'm, I'm experiencing consequences that God does not intend for me to experience. Are you listening to me? Yes. I sin. And sin demands upon recognition repentance. Repentance means that you just turn from that sin and you acknowledge the obedience that you have betrayed and you turn and start obeying God instead of rejecting God. We live in a society that used to we'd make fun of and we call it a Burger King society. Do y'all know what I'm talking about when I say Burger Kings? Everybody knows it. Have it your own way. Especially in the Western society, especially in America, we are products of individual catering, choices, options. Matter of fact, we get so upset because we don't have four or five different options. It's, it's ridiculous. And understand what I'm saying now. It's nothing wrong with this, okay? But my wife will go to McDonald's. And she'll order a half and half coffee with a splash of half and half creamer, three Splendas, and I'm going, we're at McDonald's! Get a cup of coffee! And she says, yes, but I have issues. I said, what are your issues? Well, number one, I want enough caffeine to wake me up, but I don't want enough to cause me problems. <laughs> I want it plain enough that I can taste the coffee, but I want it sweet enough that it goes down smooth. <laughs> and I, I like the milk because it gives it the right texture. <laughs> and I said, gosh, Lord have mercy. And she says, sir, what do you want? Coffee! Just plain old coffee and put it in a cup if it's not too much trouble. <laughs> we have so many choices. It's pathetic. We have so many options that some people get froze because they don't know how to make a decision. You ever been there? I went to a restaurant the other day. Again. I'm not a McDonald's connoisseur, but all my stories are kind of including McDonald's. We went to McDonald's. There's not a whole lot of choices at McDonald's, but there's quite a few. And this guy said, okay, I want the uh, Southwest salad with grilled chicken and Southwest dressing, and I'll take a tea to drink. I said, what would you want? Uh, I'm looking at him and said, dude, it's McDonald's. <laughs> Haven't changed the menu for the last 25 years. <laughs> Come on. You want a burger or salad? It's not a whole lot of choice. Chicken fried or chicken grilled? What do you want? Oh. Uh, hey, do y'all have any wraps? Get something, man. Just order. So many options, even at McDonald's, we freeze. Maybe it's time that we start rebooting and maybe start trying to intentionally live simplistic, simple, 
simple. David disobeyed God even though he went to the ark intentionally to get the ark and wanted to please God, took 30,000 men. We all agree that's intentional, right? But he failed to uh, consult the teachings, the writings, and the commands of God. How many times have we in our life had good intentions, but we failed to pray about it? We fail to ask God. Listen, I counsel with people in marriages all the time. I ask them, I come in and I said, okay, you're wanting to get married. Yeah. Why do you want to be married? We're in love. I said, okay, a couple of questions. First of all, have you prayed about it? Were, were, were we supposed to do that? Yes, you're supposed to do that. Because if all you're feeling is love and the physical attraction, let me tell you, it takes about two months to get over that. <laughs> we need marriage counseling, I guess. <laughs> it's actually better after 20 years than it was two months. Because two months, I was scratching my head and said, Lord, what hast thou done to me? Y'all know I'm telling you. Y'all know I'm telling you stinking truth. You know it. Have you prayed about it? Because it's knowing that God says this is the person that's going to get you the next three and four months, the five or six months until you get to that place that love reengages in a different level. Have you prayed about it? Have you asked God what He thinks about it? See, here's the thing. We have good intentions and we do some actions that we think are God, but we don't understand there's consequences when we don't ask God. And we call ourselves Christians. When we don't ask God, supposedly the author and the finisher of our faith, we deny Him the power and the access to interact in our lives and make a difference. To transform our lives and to correct and to conform our lives more into what His desire and His way is. And folks, when we don't contact God, when we don't ask God, when we don't pray and we do our own thing and we do it the way that we think it ought to be done, it's called disobedience and it's called sin. And I'm a sinner saved by grace. How about you? I'm a sinner saved by grace. Ah, but aren't you glad there's more to the story than what we've just told? Gosh, I've got to go. <laughs> there's more to this story. You see, David had a quick turnaround and the fact that he was all excited about getting the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and he wanted 30,000 men to help him get there and all of a sudden God said, mm, no, you didn't consult me. Matter of fact, you're disobeying me. Matter of fact, you're just, just plain out disrespecting me. Uzziah got killed on account of it and David got mad at God. How many times have we got mad of God for our disobedience? Come on. We get mad at God because we have disobeyed. There are consequences with disobedience. There are consequences with disobedience. And so many times when those consequences start bearing its face, we get mad. And when we get mad, problems begin to arise. This morning the question is, for me, how intentional are we living our lives? And do we need to take a moment, maybe, to reboot our lives and to say, God, where? Am I disobedient? Where am I disobedient? Where am I disobedient? This morning, we're going to leave it there. 
Next week, we're going to continue this scripture and this story because I've got good news to share about this story and some other things that's taking place around about the story that will give us hope. But we need to ask these questions and we need to wrestle with these questions because God is desiring so much to be with us, to bless us. God is desiring so much for us to reboot and start living in priority with Him. The only way we can do that, let things settle. Remember God. Remember Jesus. Consult Him. And then start applying it. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord, for our time together this morning. We pray, Lord, that as we discuss and have gone over some things that you will stir our spirits and our souls about some things that we need to do to make a difference in our lives. Maybe we're nearly to the point that we're frozen and fretting. And maybe we just need to reboot because we're chosen and God is for us. But we need to choose to be for Him. Help us to always to remember that and what He's done for us. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Watching. We would love for you to connect with us online. On our website, you will find up-to-date information about everything happening around here. Look for us on Facebook and Instagram. And please, download our free app on your smartphone or tablet. We are so glad you're here, and we hope you enjoy your friendship experience.